My bandsaw's too darn small. It was cheap. That's one of the few good things I can say about it. I needed to cut some thick rings from large heavy walled aluminium tube extrusion, six and a bit inches diameter and about a foot long. The bandsaw simply can't handle workpieces more than six by four inches, so trying to cut this damn great tube was going to be painful. Trying to part off a ring from this material on my lathe would present something of a challenge. I don't own a gigantic rotating tailstock centre. The largest one I've got is about three inches diameter. Perhaps it would be possible to use A-bomb 79 torque to grasp the tube with my eight inch three jaw Pratt chuck, but that would be a very silly idea. Look, Neil, we've spoken about this before. Some horrors cannot be unseen. I'm pulling the plug. Shudder. Right, in the immortal words of Jazzy B, back to life, back to reality. I may need to have access to both ends of the tube and maybe some of the interior. So making plug plates with centre drillings for a rotating tailstock centre and something similar at the chuck end, perhaps with a spigot held in a collet or a chuck, it isn't really feasible. For smaller tubes, I've made a set of expanding mandrels from acetal, which work really well. But this tube's a bit big and heavy, and I'd have to make a new mandrel for each diameter of tube I use. Perhaps then something adjustable that will grab the tube from the inside and allow it to be held concentric to a shaft and spun at reasonable speed with serious cuts and little risk of death or loss of limbs or digits might be a good move. I dug around in my metal store and found a bit of 25mm cold rolled steel and some 65mm leaded EN1A plus some 17mm hex mystery metal and a bar end of 30mm brass. So started messing about in Fusion 360. The rough spec was to make the thing modular and adjustable so I could use it to mount tubular work pieces which had a somewhat circular cross section with swappable soft jaws that could be machined to an exact fit on precision tubes or jaws with teeth that could grab circular hollow section with weld seams or not very round extrusions. This big tube is sort of round but only within a millimetre or so. That ruled out precision soft jaws. The original plan was to have a central 25mm shaft with a keyway slot and some way of locking sliding collars with telescopic jaws in place. That idea was ditched as I really wanted the fixing to be solid axially and rotationally. A set of spot drilled holes at 10mm intervals to match up with steel grub screws in the collars seemed to be a reasonable solution. I ran up a quick animated view of the CAD design and used that to make some tweaks. When I say some tweaks, this is version 19. <clears throat> the 10mm spaced holes allow plenty of adjustability and let me use two grub screws to lock the collars to the shaft. For the studs, I thought it would be fun to get some practice at single point threading instead of using horrid all thread. I drew the line at custom made nuts, but regret that choice now. Metric nuts are just so ugly. For the sake of bling and shiny, I used a bar end of 30mm brass to make the jaws. They look the part and actually work really well on the aluminium tube. I allowed for about 12mm of adjustment on the studs to give a range of 24mm in diameter. That's more than enough as there's a limited range of tubes that I need to grip. And for anything larger or smaller I'll make custom jaws. I think the four steel grub screws will act as shear pins if a tool digs in, hopefully before anything major gets smashed. Actually it's more likely the collet will slip first though. The flats on the sides of the jaws are for a 25mm spanner so I can keep the jaws aligned parallel to the tube while fiddling, uh, sorry, <coughs> making precision adjustments. I did consider using a slot and pin approach but recovered from that coffee-induced silliness 
after a little lie down. The centre tooth isn't functional, it's just there as a side effect of machining the other teeth, but somehow makes the thing look extra fierce. I decided this version would have only three internal jaws rather than four, which will make adjustments slightly more tricky. But a bit of trigonometry says that if you loosen one M12 by 1.75 nut by a quarter turn, you have to tighten the other two screws by an eighth of a turn each to compensate. And the tube moves about 0.4 millimetres as a result. There's a subtle geometric issue when the jaws are set off centre by moving one inwards a little and moving the other two outwards by half as much. In theory, one side of each of the two jaws set to the same offset will dig in deep and the other will be floating clear of the workpiece. But as the centre hole in the jaw isn't a precision fit, a couple of millimetres offset won't cause any cocking or other peculiarities. I could have used a finer thread, but in reality, this seems to be fairly easy to set for concentricity using a dial gauge. If I was doing it again, I'd use four studs and a one millimetre pitch thread instead. I thought this bar was one inch, but it was actually 25 millimetres. I still took off a 0.3 millimetre skim after drilling centres each end to make sure it was as parallel and as straight as my lathe. As the intentions to drive it using a collet rather than a live centre, I left a 40mm section of the shaft blank. My ER40 collet chuck is accurate enough for this job, but most machining operations will be at the end with the rotating tailstock centre anyway. Collets go in forwards. That's better. Oh no! It's that AI machinist again! Sigh. This is part one of the project, making all the components other than the jaws and tapping the stud holes in the sliding collars. Part two will cover those aspects and show how the thing actually works when machining big tubes. Which is why I've spent what seems like days of my life making this fixture. must keep focus on the actual job, instead of having fun making jigs and tools. It's a character defect. I'll, I'll grow up one day. I just can't do adulting properly at all. First job then, spacing off the cold roll bar. Then I'll drill centres at each end.
I like to give the tailstock Morse taper a clean with this sheepskin faced wiper before fitting a different tool to keep the chips out. Seems to work. I'm fitting a long nosed rotating centre. Mostly because it was the first one I picked up. Taking a skim off the bar is probably not necessary, but I'm doing it anyway. It's always interesting to see how precise the old Colchester is. I can usually maintain 10 micrometres diameter over a 300mm length if the material's stiff and the tool pressure's low enough. I'm ruining, uh, I mean using, a polished high rate positive carbide insert which is really intended for finish machining on aluminium. The finish is excellent but also there's very little deflection of the workpiece so precision is definitely acceptable but then I'm not that picky. I do take care to check my lathe regularly to make sure it's turning parallel but rarely need to make adjustments to the feet or the tailstock screws. It's an old clunker but it's solid. This needs a proper chamfer, but it'll stop me cutting my fingers again. I just noticed there's a bit of footage missing here. I start loosening the collet and start taking the workpiece out, but then half a second later it's magically back in the other way around. Spooky. Oh goody, more chamfering! This 17mm hex mystery metal machines remarkably well. Thank you. 
I rather like this two millimeter parting tool. It makes a great groover. A bit of die chem blue really helps to get an accurate touch off with these threading tools. That should be about it for this thread, so let's give it a try and see if it fits. Not exactly a precision thread gauge, but it looks fine to me. The next feature is the circular extension to the hex, but I'll also cut a bit of a relief so I can chamfer the corners. And that's another one ready to part off. The brass bar that's eventually going to become the teeth is also really useful to hold the threaded end of the stud while I machine the other end.
Despite being a Joe Pizinski upside down and backwards single point threading adherent, I can still cut a mean thread with the tool the right way up, using my spidey sense lightning reflexes to kill the feed before the tool crashes into the face of the workpiece, but not so early that it cuts a circle instead of a spiral. Someone's going to say it would have been quicker to use all thread, Neil. Yeah, but where's the fun in that though, Neil? Are you implying I'm snarky or summit? That's fight and talk from a yellow belly. An important historical aside. The Lincolnshire Regiment had golden waistcoats and were therefore called the yellow bellies. And no, she can't speak Yorkshire. But then, neither can I. This leaded EN1A machines remarkably well, particularly if you take a really good powerful cut. But my poor little machine can only do about 3 horsepower, so running at 1000 RPM it's difficult to take more than about a 2mm cut. If you get a good coated carbide insert and let it dig in really really deep it produces a fantastic finish, as well as really good blue season 6s. The chips do get a bit twirly at smaller depths of cut though.
making both of the collars from one piece, so I'll now I'll flip it round and machine the other end. Well, that certainly looks all right, so I'll pop it back in the chuck and part it off. The more sensitive and observant viewer may discern that there's rather a lot of smoke and that these chips are not forming very well. In fact, they're horrible. The other little matter is that this parting tool can't quite reach through to the centre bore, hence the sneaky swap. Well, as Nick would say, jobs are good un. Right, now let's bore it out. Check the calibration on this bore micrometer, but then realised that it was cold and so was the standards I was testing against. But then again, so is the workpiece. So maybe it all balances out? Who knows? Anyway, I like that number. Brimming with confidence from my measurement, 
I decided to try the real workpiece and see if the shaft fitted. Hey, hey don't get cocky, lad. Thas got another to mech yet. See, I can do regional accents. Just don't ask what region that was from. I'm Google UK female and I'm still from Surrey. You're cheeky get. Well, remarkably enough, both of them fit quite nicely. Two cheers for metrology. Now it's time to centre up the main bar on the milling machine and spot drill the 10mm hole pattern. I know edge finders aren't the most accurate way of measuring, but for this it's good enough. I only need it to be within half a millimetre or so. Once it's centred I'll use the DRO to lay out the pattern of hole. Expert metrologists may appreciate the technique here. It's the old English method. You poke it in the hole and wiggle it about a bit until it fits. Note in particular the precision consistency check by poking it in another hole and see if that fits as well. Is that really good for the edges on that expensive cobalt stub drill, Neil? Sorry, sorry, I'll get me Kurt and let me send art. Look, darling, one has a hymer, so one might as well use it now and then, for heaven's sake. It is actually a good idea because it lets me take out the backlash much more easily than it would do if I was using a rotary finder. 
there is something like 50 microns of backlash on the transverse lead screw. So you'll note that I go up to zero on one side, but on the other side I go past zero and then take the backlash out that way. When you run old cast iron lumps like I do, backlash is one of those things that you just have to work around. Well that's part one completed. The next exciting instalment sees our hero cutting the M12 threaded holes in the collars, mounting the studs, making the brass jaws and then putting the fixture to use cutting some big rings off that alley tube for candelabras and parabolic antenna mounts. The candelabras were supposed to be Christmas presents. New Year presents are a thing aren't they? Well they are now. Please subscribe if you want to see more of this nonsense. Happy New Year, one and all!